pardon me while I connect the technology here. It's good to see everyone this morning. Thank you for your attendance. If you're visiting with us, we're especially happy for your presence, and we appreciate your interest in spiritual things. This morning, as we go through the lesson, you will not need to look at your Bibles. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, that's obviously perfectly acceptable. But I've put all the scripture on the slides that you'll see on the overhead. All of the scripture comes from the English Standard Version, so it's from the ESV as we go through. This morning we're going to talk about the invitation of Jesus. Our text will be found in John chapter 7, and it's two verses, 37 and 38. Jesus' great gospel invitation that he gives during the Feast of Booze is 29 words. 29 words, pregnant with meaning, packed with meaning. And we're going to dissect this and unpack this this morning and try and understand everything Jesus was giving in this invitation. Let's begin reading. On the last day of the great feast, excuse me here, just a second. Had a bug on the podium. <laughs> Satan is already working alive and well, okay? But he is no more. <laughs> John chapter 7. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jerry read for us a prophecy from Zechariah that in the great day of the Lord, living waters would flow first from Jerusalem to the east and to the west. In the summer and the winter, it would never be dry, all directions, all seasons, and that the name of the Lord would be known in all the earth. As you read here, the first phrase, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, so first, we're going to dissect that. We have to get the setting. We, not being Jewish people, not celebrating the Feast of Booze, are at a disadvantage trying to see the imagery here and the symbolism that's present when Jesus talks about being thirsty. So we're going to have to spend a couple minutes talking about what, what this is on the last day of the feast. This is an artist's rendering of the Israelites camped out in Sinai in the wilderness there, possibly before the mountain of God. It's nighttime. You see the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. You see the pillar of fire, the presence of God that was with his people. And you see the dwelling that the Israelites lived in. Tents. Temporary structures. The Feast of Booths was where each Jewish family was to build a temporary structure, a booth, a tabernacle, if you will. And for seven days, they were to come out of their dwelling and live in these temporary structures. It would remind them of what their people went through in the exodus out of Egypt. This is a modern day booth, presumably of a Jewish family that's getting ready to celebrate the festival of booths. Modern day Hebrew word is Sukkot. This is a picture of the temple. That would have been in Jesus' day, okay? This is the second. This is not Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple's been destroyed. They come back from captivity. Ezra begins to build the temple, and then Herod adds on to it. 46 years, I believe. It's a great structure. To give you an idea of the size, this is where the Holy of Holies is in here, and this is the courtyard of women, okay? And in that place... The distance here in these two areas is well over a football field. 
over 50 yards wide, 100 yards long, would have been able to hold hundreds, potentially thousands of people, okay? In the water ceremony, the priest would enter over here through this gate. This gate right here was called the water gate. And he would come into that courtyard and take water and do something with it. Out here, this is the court of the Gentiles that surrounds the temple. This would be Solomon's portico where the early church would have met. And we know this temple was destroyed in AD 70, okay? So Jesus' great invitation occurs during the Feast of Booze on the last day, the great day, and he would have been standing somewhere in that courtyard. The dedication of Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8-2 occurred during the Feast of Booze. After the people returned from Babylon, after the captivity, Nehemiah 8.17, and all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. Think about that. From the time of Joshua until they returned from captivity, the people had not celebrated the Feast of Booths like they were commanded to. They had gotten so far away from God, possibly because they didn't even know. The setting for our Lord's great gospel invitation, John chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jewish Feast of Booths was at hand. So it was also called the Feast of Tabernacles. It was one of the three annual feasts all Jewish males were to attend. Passover, Pentecost, and then the Feast of Booze. It was to last for seven days. It was to be observed by people making and dwelling in these booths, a lean-to with three walls. It was to be observed with rejoicing. It was the only Jewish feast where there was a direct command from God to be joyful. You are to rejoice during this feast. It was to be observed perpetually. We saw where the Israelites did not do that. It was to commemorate the sojourn of Israel in the wilderness with God's provision. How he provided food. How he provided water from the rock. How their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never wore out. Forty years. God's provision. His blessings. How he took care of his people. During the water ceremony, and we'll talk about that in a minute, thousands of people would have been singing the Hallel. The Hallel is Psalm 113 to 118. They wouldn't have had a book like we had, all those people, they couldn't have afforded it, to pick up and read. They memorized it. They knew Psalm 113, 14, 15, 16, 17. They sang that from their hearts. What is the water ceremony? Each day on the Feast of Booze, and the last day, this ceremony was observed multiple times. That's why the last day is called the Great Day. That's when Jesus waited to give this invitation. The water ceremony, the priest would go down to the Pool of Siloam. He would take a golden vessel. He would go to the Pool of Siloam and dip water out of the Pool of Siloam. He would march back to the temple. He would go through the water gate into the temple courtyard in front of the holy place by the altar. He would pour water out onto the altar. The water representing life, representing God's salvation, God's blessing, God's provision for his people. And while he was pouring out the water, the people would be singing and chanting and reciting Isaiah chapter 12. Let's look at Isaiah 12 verses 3 through 6. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. Those words sound familiar? That was our second song this morning. We sang those words, okay? We sang about that. He is in our midst. Proclaim that His name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord. For he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy. O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Picture these Jewish people. They're standing there. They're singing about God's day of deliverance that would come in the future. When the Messiah would come. And 
They were singing about the Holy One of Israel. One day he will be in our midst. And here was this poor man in his early 30s who had come there. John 7, earlier in the chapter, says privately, had on a simple tunic, a robe, standing there in their midst. He was right there. And the Jewish people couldn't see him spiritually. They didn't understand. They thought the Messiah would come in great physical pomp and circumstance. He came lowly. He came humble. He came as a servant. And there he is standing there, listening to the people sing from psalm, listening to them recite from memory Isaiah chapter 12, watching the priest pour out the water on the altar And in his great invitation, he's going to mention water. He's going to talk about being thirsty. After the priests would have done this, and on the last day they did it seven times where they marched around the altar to commemorate the fall of Jericho, the Jewish people did as tradition. After that, Jesus, in their midst, the Holy One of Israel, literally in their midst, stands up and says... Now we come to our next phrase. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, Jesus pointing to himself, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. If you're following along in your Bible, some of the translations say out of the inner man. The Greek there, the literal, is out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Jesus says that to the crowd. And I'm sure they were stunned by those words. So now we're going to unpack those 29 words and try and understand what this great gospel invitation of Jesus is all about. If anyone thirsts, Jesus begins his invitation with an inquiry. Is anyone thirsty? I would ask you today, are you thirsty? I would ask myself, am I thirsty? Our first song, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. Does that describe you? We know what physical thirst is all about. Water is absolutely essential for life. I didn't think about it because I didn't think it would really affect me, but right now my mouth is so dry. It's, It's nerves. And somebody said, make sure you take some water up there. I thought, I'm going to be nervous enough. I didn't want to spill water. So, um, but it's true. Water is absolutely essential for life. We think about our physical bodies. We are over 90% H2O. Over 90% water. Blood, our cells, water is in everything. It symbolizes life. In the Middle East where it's dry and desert, water is truly life-giving. We can go weeks without eating food. You can't go weeks without drinking water. Water is absolutely essential. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about physical thirst. He was talking about spiritual thirst. Are you seeking spiritual satisfaction? Only Jesus provides the answer to philosophical questions like, Why am I here? Who am I? Why was I even born? What is the purpose to life? What is the meaning of my life? God is watching from his throne to see if any of us truly understand what life is all about. That's what God is doing. He is in heaven. He's looking down upon the earth to see if any of us truly get what life is all about. What life is all about is seeking after God. Worshiping God. That's what we were made for. Our inner being, our inner thirst will never be satisfied until we realize that and we seek after God with our whole heart. Psalm 14, verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. If you're not seeking after God and what He wants you to do in your life, you don't understand what your life is all about. Nor do I. David was thirsty. We see this concept in the Old Testament. 
Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. David understood, see? Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Jesus, in talking to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, talks to her about thirst and water. She's come for physical water to relieve physical thirst. Jesus talks to her about spiritual thirst and living water. He says to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water, we see in this verse, is a gift of God that is only available through Jesus. Knowledge is critical. Notice here what Jesus says. If you knew the gift of God and who it is. If you knew, he tells a woman. If you knew the gift of God. If you knew who it is that's speaking to you, you would have asked for living water. She didn't know. Hosea 4, verse 6, the beginning words of that verse, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If we don't have knowledge, we won't know. If we don't know, we'll never seek it. We'll never ask for it. If we don't know, we won't have faith. Romans 10, 17, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's through the word that we develop faith, that we understand the story of the Bible, what God has done for us through His love, through His mercy and His grace. Knowing is absolutely critical. It's not about feeling. It's not about a warm, fuzzy feeling experience. It's about knowledge that comes from the Word of God. He says in verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Notice that Jesus again talks about thirst. If you take the living water that Jesus gives, you'll never be spiritually thirsty. You will always be spiritually satisfied. You'll understand what life is. You'll have peace and contentment, happiness. The water that Jesus gives becomes, it's transforming a spring. It wells up to eternal life. It becomes within us a spring. It's transforming. And it wells up. The source is continual. Where is the source? What is the source? Remember what Jesus told the woman? It's a gift of God. Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Right here, the Lord forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. The Lord God is talking. Yahweh, Jehovah God, Lord God Almighty, God our Father. He refers to himself as the fountain of living water. He's the source. Jeremiah 17, verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So we learn here in Jeremiah that God is the fountain of living waters. He is the source of the gift that Jesus was talking to the woman at the well about. It only comes through Jesus, but the source is God. This concept of being thirsty and living water is also found in the last two chapters of the Bible. It's found in the Old Testament, it's found in the New Testament, and it's found in the last two chapters of our Bible. Revelation 21, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Water of life 
equals living water. It's water that comes from God. It is alive. Okay? Without payment. Why? Because Jesus paid the price on the cross. Revelation 22, 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you. So that's Jesus speaking through his angel to John, who was on the Isle of Patmos, about these things for the churches. The audience there is the seven churches of Asia. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is her thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Doesn't that sound like Jesus talking to the woman at the well? If you're thirsty, and if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me, and I would give you this living water. It will become within you something that transforms, that becomes a spring of life, welling up to eternal life. That's exactly what he's telling John, or telling John to tell to these seven churches. It's without price, it's without payment, the water of life. Are you thirsty? We spend a lot of time talking about if anyone is thirsty, okay? But we need to understand the only requirement to come to Jesus is that you know and understand Jesus is the only need you have. That's it. That's the only requirement. Doesn't matter if you're poor, you're rich, you're white, you're black, you're Hispanic, you're Asian. Doesn't matter. We are all one. Just as I am, I come broken. The familiar song that we sing. That's what Jesus tells us. You come to me just as you are, and I will give you living water. I will spiritually heal you. All right, what's the next phrase? After, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Okay? What does this phrase mean? The water of life referred to in Revelation 21 and 22 is free. As the text states, the water of life is without payment, without price. Jesus paid the price on the cross. And what a, what a high price that was. Tyler, the imagery, he painted for us this morning. What a high price God paid in the giving of a son and what Jesus went through. To take care of my sin and your sin. The water of life is the living water Jesus offers the Samaritan woman at the well. It is only available through Jesus and it is the gift of God who is the fountain of living waters. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me. The text right there tells us what it means to come to Jesus and drink. The phrase, let him come to me and drink equals believes in me. See the parallelism? If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Anyone, whoever, come to me and drink, believes in me. So now we understand that coming to Jesus and drinking is believing in Jesus. Now all we have to figure out is, what does that mean? How do I believe in Jesus? Man has his own ideas. I'm going to share with you this morning from the Word of God and the Scripture what it means to believe in Jesus. Whoever believes in me, that's coming to Jesus and drinking. This is very misunderstood in Christianity. It's more than a simple decision. It involves action on our part. Coming to Jesus and drinking implies action. It implies that we come to Jesus on his terms. The Bible clearly teaches that obedience is involved in God's concept of belief. Look at John 8, 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If anyone is thirsty, let him keep my words. Obedience and belief, they're inseparable. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Look at that. 
God says through the Holy Spirit and the Hebrew writer, they did not enter my rest. Why? Because they were disobedient. He wants us to understand what disobedience is. It's unbelief. So then we have almost like a parenthetical statement. So we see that they were not able to enter that rest because of unbelief. God reveals to us in his word that disobedience is a synonym for unbelief. Therefore, obedience is a synonym for belief. Now we're getting to see a picture of what it means to believe in Jesus. It clearly involves obedience in keeping Jesus' word. It is more than head knowledge and head belief. It is more than that. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Although he was the son talking about Jesus, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The religious world doesn't like to talk about obedience. That means following something. That means submitting yourselves to a higher authority. We all like to do exactly what they did in Judges. Everyone followed what was right in his own eyes. To obey Jesus is to believe in Jesus. Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, to all who believe in him. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What a beautiful verse to see that believing is to obey. John 3, 36. Now, if you have the New King James Version, unfortunately, the translator of that version chose to render two different Greek words that have two different Strong's number the same. The New King James says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. So there it's not so clear. Because it says, if you believe, you have life. If you don't believe, you won't have life. So believe, believe. But that's because the translator, I don't think, did a good job with the Greek. It's two different Greek words there. Two different Strong's number. If you look at the English Standard Version, which we just looked at, and you look at the American Standard Version, it's believe you have life. If you don't obey, you don't have life. And the wrath of God remains upon you. Obedience and belief are together. They are inseparable in God's mind. To believe in Jesus is to obey Jesus. It's to obey the gospel. We're going to look at one New Testament example. Acts 16, verse 30. Then he, that's the jailer, brought them, that's Paul and Silas, out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer saw them singing. He knew something was different about Paul and Silas. So he says, Sirs, what do I need to do to be saved? Verse 31, and they, that's Paul and Silas, said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Look at verse 34, a couple of verses later. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Literally just a couple of verses later. It's past tense, he's already done it. There's great rejoicing. Why? Because the jailer and his whole household had believed in God. Two verses before, he's saying, what do I need to do to be saved? Paul and Silas says, you believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Several verses later, there's rejoicing because the jailer has already believed. So all we have to do to find out what it means to believe in Jesus in this example is look at two verses. That's it. Two verses. Here, they're told to believe for what you want, salvation, and now there's rejoicing because, hey, we already did it. We believed in God. So what happens between here and here? It's very simple. Verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Why is that important? Romans 10, 17, without the word of the Lord, you won't know about his grace. You won't know about mercy, about repentance about confessing his name before men. 
okay? It's only through the word that we gain faith, that we develop faith, that we understand the story God has given us. So they spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer and his household. The next verse, verse 33, And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he, that's the jailer, was baptized at once, he and all his family. Two things to believe in Jesus, to believe in God. It requires two things. Number one, you teach them Jesus. You teach them the word of the Lord. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You teach them the words of the Lord, the words of Christ. And secondly, you baptize them in the name of Jesus. When you do those two things, you have believed in God, just like the jailer. Two things, Paul and Silas speak the word of the Lord to the jailer. Paul and Silas baptize the jailer in the middle of the night. Notice the urgency. In the religious world, if someone was sharing Christ with someone, and the one they were sharing Christ with, telling them the Bible story, speaking to them the word of the Lord, said, hey, I hear what you're saying. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. What do I do? Oftentimes, they would pray with them the sinner's prayer to invite Jesus in their heart. That's not what they did in the New Testament. Paul and Silas, in the middle of the night, baptized this man and his whole house. In the middle of the night. If someone wants to believe in Jesus, it will involve teaching them the word of the Lord and baptizing them in water in the name of Jesus. This is what happened to the jailer and his household. Let's look at our next phrase. As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay? At first glance, you may be thinking, oh, this could be a little bit more difficult. No. It's very simple. If we use scripture to interpret scripture. So Jesus says, as the scripture has said, what is the Old Testament passage Jesus is referring to here? The difficulty in that lies that if you look in the Old Testament, you cannot find an exact phrase that says those exact words. Most commentators think Jesus is pointing to a picture that would be painted by several Old Testament passages, just as Isaiah 58.11, Joel 3.18, Zechariah 13.1, what our brother Jerry read for us today, Zechariah 14, verse 8. And then there's the vision of the temple, the new temple. In Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12, that has this trickle of water flowing out of the temple, out of the whole temple, out of the Holy of Holies. I believe that's what Jesus is referring to, Ezekiel's vision. The New Testament Christian who is the temple of the living God in the New Covenant. To understand what living water is, all we have to do is look at verse 39. We're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. John 7, 39. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, now this. Remember, verse 38 ends with, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this. This refers to living water. He, that's Jesus. Jesus is the one standing up on the last great day of the Feast of Booze, giving this invitation to thousands of people that would have been assembled for the water ceremony in front of the most holy, in front of the holy place. Okay? Jesus said it's about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay? So Jesus had to die. He had to be buried. He had to be resurrected from the dead. And then he had to ascend into heaven to be glorified. So what Jesus is talking here is about in the future, not too many days from now, everyone who believes in me and we understand what that involves. Everyone will receive the Spirit, okay? Which is the living water. And it will flow from the heart of every believer. 
You know, the scripture could have said, now this he said about the word. Now this he said about himself. But it didn't. It says, now this he said about the spirit. But if you think about that, a little side note, man in his attempt to explain the how has created artificial dis division. We have people that want to say, oh, it's the word only. No, it's, it's the spirit himself. That's artificial. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians it says the Spirit and the Lord. The Lord is the Spirit. In Acts 16, two verses, it talks about this Holy Spirit would not allow Paul to go into this region and preach. The very next verse says the, Holy Spirit, or it says the Spirit of Jesus. The Word is living and powerful. It's unlike any book. We, we, we can't understand that. The Word, the Spirit of God, of Christ, and Jesus, in a sense, is all one. Man has artificially tried to break it up at times. And obviously we know Jesus the Son died on the cross. The Spirit was given after He was glorified. God the Father was watching this from heaven. So in a sense, they're all three different. We, we understand that. But here, all I want you to see is that the living water is the Spirit. When Jesus spoke of living water, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus mentions the phrase living water only twice in the New Testament. John 4 and again in John 7. We need to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Therefore, living water equals Holy Spirit. And when you think about it for a second, Jesus the God-man, God incarnate, if he were literally here in our midst, right now, we would be able to see the God-man, God incarnate. He is here right now in our midst, but in spirit form only. His glorified risen spirit. The Spirit of Christ is here. The Spirit of God. The man who we could touch and feel the nail prints like Thomas and feel his side. He is in heaven at the right hand of God. But the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, which is Christ Himself, and we'll see a couple verses that put that together for us, is here with us. I want you to see, though, that from the Scripture, this isn't what Randy Little thinks. This is what the Scripture says. Now this living water, He, Jesus, said about the Spirit, whom everyone who believed in Him were to receive. Understanding John 4 and 7, we now understand that the water of life in Revelation 21 and 22 is a synonym for the living water, which is the Holy Spirit. So living water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Now we come to a verse that we can understand better. For years, this verse puzzled me. I thought, why does it have the word drink in there? Why is it talking about drinking in this verse? But now that I understand that the living water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Now I understand this verse. For in one spirit, the power, by one spirit, the power comes from God. This is not of us, it's from God. We are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. When we obey the gospel, we enter his body. We drink the living water. We are all made to drink of one spirit. So when we obey the gospel of Jesus, we enter his body. When we obey the gospel of Jesus, we drink the living water, we receive the Holy Spirit. To obey the gospel of Jesus is to come to Jesus and drink. It is to believe in Jesus. Those are all synonyms. Anyone, whoever, those who believe in him were to receive. This tells us that every New Testament Christian receives the Holy Spirit. If you've obeyed the gospel, you have received the Holy Spirit. You were made to drink of one spirit. You drank the living water. And God's spirit, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit is alive in you. Now let me say a couple side notes. 
So I don't want any misunderstanding about this. The sermon is not about what I'm about to talk about. But when I say we receive the Spirit, I just want to make myself clear about a couple things over here. Number one, does that mean that we have the reception? Have we received the ability to perform supernatural, miraculous things? No. Why? Because that required the laying on of hands by an apostle. There are no apostles today to lay their hands on us. So oftentimes I think we were confused receiving God's Holy Spirit when we obey the gospel as receiving the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. Those miraculous manifestations were imparted by the laying of hands on by the apostles. We don't have that today. Like Paul said in Corinthians, prophecies will cease. Tongues will cease. Inspired knowledge will cease. It's because we have the Word, the complete revelation. That's why we don't need those things today to confirm the Word. We have the entire picture. We have the entire revelation of God. He no longer speaks like He did in days of old through the prophets. He speaks through His Word. So number one, I'm not talking about miracles. Don't misunderstand me. We do not have that ability today because the apostles aren't with us to lay their hands on us. Number two, Am I guided by the Holy Spirit? Am I led by the Holy Spirit? Yes, absolutely. Amen. Does he speak to me in my ear? No. Only when I have my Bible app on and I'm listening to someone read the scripture. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us through the word. So understand that. The word and the word alone. Okay, I'm going to end. Bear with me. We're almost done. Y'all have been great. I appreciate your attention. I know I've already gone over. I gave this several times to my wife. And no matter how I worked, and she gave me advice, and I changed, each time got longer. <laughs> and so bear with me. We're almost done. I'm going to end with three questions. Question number one, do you belong to Christ? Romans 8, 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Amazing things we learn from this one simple verse. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God, is the spirit of Christ. There's only one spirit. There's only one living water. And if you have not drank the living water, you do not have the Spirit of Christ, then you don't belong to Him. And the only way we drink the living water is being baptized into His body, is obeying the command to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Look at the very next verse, Romans 8, verse 10. We learn something else. But if Christ is in you, all right? Verse 9 ends with, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Paul is saying, but on the other side of the coin, on the contrary, if Christ is in you, so there we learn that Christ in you equals the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you, equals the Spirit of God dwelling in you, okay? The Spirit of God dwelling in us is equal to the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us, is equal to Christ dwelling in us. Do you belong to Christ? Is the Spirit of Christ alive in you? Second question, are you in the faith? Well, how do I know if I'm in the faith? Paul gives us a test in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Well, how do I do that? How do I do that, Randy? How do I test myself? How do I examine myself? I didn't put the rest of this verse on here on purpose. If you've got this verse memorized, then you know what the answer is. But if you don't have it memorized, you're sitting there thinking, okay, all right, how do I examine myself? How do I test myself? Guess what? It's based on God's Word. It's based on something you either know or don't know. It's based on something you realize or don't realize. Let's look at the rest of the verse. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living in you, if you do not have the Spirit of God living in you, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ living in you, if you don't have Christ in you, you're not in the faith. 
you don't belong to Jesus. Are you thirsty? Are you tired of what this world has to offer? I've lived 62 years. I've seen a lot, experienced a lot, and let me tell you, all this world has to offer is stuff. And stuff does not fulfill us. It just doesn't. You know that as well as I do. Whether you're young or old, if you're young, you can picture yourself saying, I want X at Christmas, whatever X is. You hope, you think about it, you dream about it, you tell your parents about it, and you hope, and on Christmas, you get X, or your birthday, you get X. Six months later, X is in the closet, covered up with clothes or other toys. It's not very important. This world doesn't have anything to offer us that is going to be lasting, eternal, and is going to fulfill what we feel inside, that spiritual thirst. Jesus is the answer to our thirst. Jesus is the only answer. That is our only answer. If you are subject to the invitation of Jesus, if you have never obeyed the gospel, Jesus wants you to come to him and drink. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to understand this is only available because of God's grace, his love and his mercy. And if you are baptized in his name, you get two things. You get remission of sin, forgiveness of sin through his blood, and you drink the living water. You receive the spirit of the almighty God. Jesus himself in spirit form, the glorified risen Lord. If you haven't drank the living water, will you please come while we stand and sing? There's a fountain.